Hello, my name is Paul Ashworth, and I'm here interviewing at the Cincinnati Public Library in Hamilton County, uh, Mr. Ed Hockey, on July the 11th, 19, 2006, at the uh, Main Library. Um, good morning. How are you today? Fine, thank you, sir. Uh, I give you your basic background here, and uh, you're married, I take it then? Widow. Widow. And you're from Cincinnati? Yes. And you were born and raised there? Yes. And you enlisted in the, in the, in the Merchant Marine? No, no. No, that's what I want to get straight. Okay. I went in the Navy. Okay. Yeah. On the 26th of December, 1941. What a Christmas present. Uh, then on the 12th of January of 42, I was sworn in the Navy. And on the 24th of January, I left for Great Lakes for training boot camp. Okay. And as you went through boot training, how did you uh, wind up in, on a uh, Merchant Marine? Well, they needed, I guess they needed gun crews, and at the whole time they were just putting everybody in there. But I did volunteer myself and a friend to go on merchant ship because they figured they have to come back and get more cargo, so you'd have to come back to the States. Good so, but we all went anyway. Okay. And on the, what the heck, went to gunnery school at Little Creek, Virginia in July of 1942. We went to gunnery school at Little Creek. Then in, at the end of July, I was assigned to a tanker, the R.M. Parker Jr. It was at Baltimore Shipyards. So we went down there and got on the ship. And I didn't know the, what the pointed end from the round end was. I didn't even know it was a tanker until somebody told me. And there were six in the gun crew, and we had a coxswain as a petty officer. He's a, a third class boatswain mate. But, and we left there to go down around the keys, and we had to stop at Norfolk to get orders. And the coxswain went ashore with the captain, and he never came back. So he, he jumped the ship. And there was just six of us, so we need, we had to have four hours on and eight hours off, so we worked that out two to a watch, and that's how we did it. The rest of the tour then, we had just the six of you? Yeah. They never assigned their replacement? No, because we never had a chance to. And then when we went around, went down the coast and around the Keys, and up into the Gulf of Mexico, and we got off of the mouth of the Mississippi, and uh, it's called Point Lafour, and we were on the August the twelfth. We were torpedoed at midnight by a U-171. It put two torpedoes into us, and I was on watch with this uh, other fellow. And it's just about split the ship in half. And uh, if you're down in the Gulf, there's a Gulf Stream. It's phosphorus in the water. And you can shake your hand around and stir up light. And we see these two flashes of light coming across the water. And nobody had to tell us it was torpedoes. Because we knew that what it was. They were just riding side by side. What about a second difference? And one hit, and then like a second or so, the other one hit. Wow. And, uh, and we're screaming our heads off. And we didn't have any communication with the bridge through a uh, telephone system. Because things were crude in them days. And our only armament was a 5-inch 51 and two water-cooled 50 caliber machine guns. And as far as I was concerned, as far as I was concerned, the 50 caliber water-cooled was useless because of the way you had to operate them. But when the ship they took a heavy list, and the guns were useless anyway because we were almost at a 45-degree angle because of the because it split the ship and had the water rushing in and it tilted. It. Mm. And while the merchant crew, uh, crew was getting the lifeboats over, the third, the second mate asked me to go with me. On the stern of a ship, there's a big wheel back there, and you can turn it and turn off the screw, the propeller. Hmm. So he asked me to go with him, and we, we, we turned off that propeller back off, and that's when I, I fell over to hurt my knee on that. Uh, but we got back, and uh, we had a go down end over end in the lines to the water. By that time the boat was in the water. And we had to go down hand over hand into the boat and we swim out to the lifeboat. And we were in the lifeboat. And then there, uh, 
one merchant sailor, he started hitting the water with an oar and he said there was a shark there. And I, I never knew for sure. But we pulled away from it because that was the standard thing to pull away because if the ship would sink, suppose they would could pull you down with it. You know, now I don't know how much okay. there is in that. But uh, you often wonder mm -hmm. just that. But uh, we pulled away and then all of a sudden there was a big flash. The Germans shelled the ship five times. And the first shell hit the ready box on the after gun tub and ex exploded. And that's just where myself and this other fellow were standing on watch. Now I don't uh, really remember anything till morning. But they, in the morning they, uh, I took off my, I remember I took off my dog tags and I took, the, I had a pistol and I put that aside because our orders were if the Germans sur surface, they come up to you, just say you were a merchant sailor and they maybe not take you prisoner of war, you know. Mm -hmm. So then in the morning I put my dog tags back on and, uh, uh, but the, the Germans never molested us, they didn't bother us, they, they had left and they, and uh, we were out there and then this other lifeboat, we was right in the vicinity so we decided to get together and we elected somebody in charge of the boat and we elected the second mate to be in charge. Now, you're right in the Gulf and only 90 miles from shore, but down there you could drift south and get out in the middle mm -hmm. and, no, and you wouldn't, you'd be out of, out of the lines, uh, shipping lanes and nobody would find you. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we went on rations right away and, and at some time in the morning they give us about an ounce of water to drink and a biscuit to eat. And, and oh, I guess several hours later, a PBY flew over and spotted us and dropped a message that we were be located and they would come out and pick us up. And there's a little fishing trawler named, I found out later, it was called Pioneer. And they come out and they picked us up and brought us into Morgan City, Louisiana. And from Morgan City, we went by bus back to New Orleans. There was an armed guard base there. And we went there, and I was there a couple days, and uh, I was spent one day in the hospital, and there was a couple more days, and they give us 15 days leave and travel time, so I, I come home. Uh -huh. Excellent. And I was in the uh, armed guard receiving station in Brooklyn for a, about a week, and I was assigned to the SS Carrillo. The SS Carrillo was a banana boat. By owned by United Fruit Company, and all it did was go in the Caribbean. Can I ask you a question before we start? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, the, the first one. I just, uh, I'm surprised to hear that you were torpedoed so close to the United States and in the Gulf to, to boot. Well, <coughs> I forgot, but there was 200 ships, merchant ships, some off of our East Coast. East Coast? Yes. But in the Gulf? <coughs> there was about 12. They actually were patrols, because I don't think we read about that. No, no. I don't <coughs> it, 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 it wasn't in the history books either, you know. Right, but the... the, the I think there's... Was there someone over there? Oh, on your side. Oh, sorry. Now, I always read that the, the East Coast and then out in the, the Atlantic, yeah. but I didn't know they came back. You said you were 90 miles from the <coughs> yeah. shore, and they stole tea cups. Uh, yeah. Tea yeah. yeah. Well, during the war, now, they used to say off of Cape Patras, yeah. They call that the, the graveyard. I've read that, yes. And people would go down there to watch ships get sunk. Yeah, I mean, you'd, at a distance, you see the smoke. And, uh, Probably. But there was 200 ships sunk off our east coast. And in the, in the Gulf, there were about a dozen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, like you said, we don't read about that. No, no. Uh, I'm sorry, but you, you can, can please continue. Well, I, uh, I went aboard the Crow, which I said was a banana boat. And it went down to the Caribbean to the different islands. And I made four trips to England from September of 42 till the spring of 43. Later, I on his history to landing because at one time in March, they said that British were just about on the verge of being out of supplies. Mm -hmm. and, and for some reason, they called off the wolf packs and they survived. And uh, I spent... Well, when you were going on those, were you a single 
ships? No, we would go in convoys. Convoy, right. On 30 ships to a convoy. And we'd have British and Canadian escort. Now, I never seen an American ship in the North Atlantic until the fall of 43 to the invasion of North Africa. Because they were saving the ships for that. And the British and the Canadians took over the convoy duty. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I, that's another thing I probably remember reading. Yeah. It was just for that. Yeah. And uh, you'd be going along and you'd see a flash or hear a boom and it'd be a ship get a hit and you just kept on going because you couldn't stop sure. because there was a designated ship that would pick up survivors. Mm -hmm. Now we were going along one day and the ship right next to us got hit and I, I had a camera in my life jacket and another fellow had a camera and he had it. I had to go from the bridge to my battle station and he had to go to, and neither one of us took a picture. We were, I guess the training to come in and you took off and you went to your battle station, but they, the guys were saying, they said, well, they weren't gonna let us carry the cameras anymore because we wasn't reliable because we, within 50 feet or 100 feet, there was a ship that was torpedoed and it was, you know, and we missed it. Uh -huh. Were you designated to carry a camera? No, no, they were forbidden. That's what I thought. Yeah, and you're, you're one line to have them. And I never took pictures of any American ships. Because that would be, well, you just didn't do it, you know. Okay. Because they had uh, fall in enemy hands and all that. But I took pictures of Italian ships, British ships, and, and uh, German airplanes, and uh, uh, German peat, or e-boats, they called it. Uh, but I never took any, any uh, uh, of American ships. Then I, uh, can we show these as far as close-ups or anything? Or? Uh, well, I think it might be a little bit early for them. Uh, okay, I'm glad that maybe the one with the... Well, that's all, that goes off to the Morrison Wake. That's when okay. I was in the Philippines. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Please continue then. And then I got off of the Carrilla in the fall of 43, and I went aboard the Dan <laughs> And we went into the Mediterranean, the Medi uh, to the Mediterranean. The first one we carried high test gasoline in Ooh. drums. Wow. And uh, we were going to drop them off at a town called Lakata, I think. But uh, Palermo was open, and we was one of the first ships to go into Palermo. And we went in the, there, and we discharged our cargo. And then we shuttled back and forth a couple times from Africa to, Italy, to Sicily. And we went back to the United States and we were refitted to carry troops. So the next trip out we carried uh, uh, infantrymen and we brought them into Oran. And we discharged them on about Thanksgiving because they, we still had them on at Thanksgiving, but they were fighting in Monte Cassino then. And, uh, and I understand that these troops just about left our ship went to Italy and right to the casino mm. uh, mm. because uh, they were needed. And uh, they, were, uh, they were shot up pretty bad, I understand. Mm. Uh, I talked to a guy that come down to the dock one time and, and he seen the ship and he went up and he was talking to us and that they were shot up pretty bad. Mm. But we went back to Sicily and we spent Christmas there in Sicily and was 43, and th this, this is the good part. We going back to Africa, and they put on about 500 Moroccan soldiers and 100 horses. Uh -huh. And these guys, they call, call them Gomis or Gomis, something like that. And they were they were they were mean dudes. And they now this is what we heard in the early days that they, the French or British Americans paid them and they got 15 francs for German years oh. and 10 francs for Italian years. <laughs> and they said it was a big joke, they would come running to the lines with their hands over their and to surrender to the Americans or to the British. But I, you don't know if that's true or not. You know. <laughs> but we had a hundred horses and we had these guys on there and we brought them back to Oran and they wouldn't let them go ashore there. We had to bring them down to a little town called the Moors. And they brought them, sent them ashore there and they had escort 
of MPs, them going and they bought them out of town and up into the hills, we understand. Because they 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 were they were not the uh, friendliest of people, you know. Uh -huh. But they were they were really something to see, huh? Uh -huh. But uh, uh, you got a kick out of it because we see all these horses running down to the dock, you know, we get back to the ship and they're in there loading them on, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, there are also they had some goats and some chickens. Oh my God. And it was some kind of a, a religious time of the year, and they would not eat from dawn to dusk. And at, at dusk, they would make little fires on the deck, and they would whatever they were eating, that they would cook that, you know. Uh -huh. But they, they were, uh -huh. <laughs> and they were on our side, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but they were mercenaries. Uh, okay. And then uh, I got off of the uh, Daniel Uber, I guess, in the spring. And I've come home on leave and went back and got on the Morrison Wait. And uh, we made one trip and we went down to uh, Puerto Rico and we got a load of sugar and we brought that up to New Orleans. And then there we loaded up with uh, general cargo and uh, we had some Hagen boats and some small uh, tugboats and a, two air rescue boats. They were 50 feet long and were speed boats. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the rest of the cargo was. And we brought that into New Guinea. Oh, New Guinea? Yes. Uh, and we, uh, then we shuttled back and forth all over New Guinea, up and down the coast, bringing cargo here and taking it there and dropping it off and picking it up. And, and uh, one time we went into a place where we were and they had these native people working, and we were loading them on bombs, and they knew what a bomb was, and so when they would swing the boom over to drop the bomb in a hole, these little guys would run like heck <laughs> to get away from them because they knew what it was, and, they, and then they'd roll them over in the corner, and then we loaded up with bombs, and we brought them up to another place in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And by that time, I guess they were getting ready for the Philippines. And we, we took on an Air Force uh, group, and they're laying some of their equipment. Now, uh, of course, the planes were all just going to be flowing to the Philippines, but we took the rest of it. And we went up into Lady, and we got there, I guess, in October of 44, I guess. And we stayed, we stayed six weeks, and we had over 200 air raids. About every two hours, there'd be another air raid. And, and that's when we were hit the kamikazes, where they, they started using kamikazes. And there was three merchant ships. We were probably one of the first merchant ships that got hit with kamikaze planes. Mm -hmm. there, and uh, we got one on the side. And there's the, the picture of the one on uh, the side. And uh, at that, during, while we were there, the six week we were there, we shot down. They give us credit for. Four. They give us credit for four planes, but I think we probably shot down seven. But they, we didn't get the credit for all of them. Uh, and these air, and then uh, we painted the. We authorized. We painted them on the stacks. But there was a, a German ship plane shot down in Anzio by the crew of the Marcel Wade, and someone was still on there, and we put the German plane on top of that. Uh, so you had. Actually, four kills yourself. Then. Yeah. Perfect. 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 And they was, I read that the merchant, the armed guard, shot down over 100 planes in the Philippines. But uh, if you read the books, you'll never find it. They, they just didn't give us credit. They, uh, I don't know. Uh, you'd, you'd say you were in the armed guard. They'd say, what did you do? Guard a shipyard or something, you know? And, but then when you say you was on merchant ships, and they say, well, you're in the merchant, we say, no, we was in the Navy gun crews. Uh, and there was 144,000 of us. We sailed on 7,000 ships. Oh. And seven, over 700 were sunk. So if you break it down, I read that we were, at, at one time we were the most, percentage-wise, we were in the most dangerous part of the Navy for casualties. Mm -hmm. We had the highest casualty rate of any other naval group. 
in the early days, because after 43 or 44, then when submarine warfare come to an end or slow down, we didn't lose the ships like we did in the early days, you know. Uh, now, when you were, uh, were you with the same six crew? No, no, we, we uh, when we got hit, and we got to New Orleans, we went back to Brooklyn, and then we went, went different ways on different ships. So you weren't with the same six? No, no, no. Uh, you know, I don't, I never really got to know them, any of them that well, because we was only thinking, it was only on three weeks when it was sunk. Okay. So you really didn't get to know anybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't, you didn't get to know the merchant crew, and you didn't get, well, it's it just, because you're, you're standing and watch eight hours a day, and them other people are either sleeping or doing something else, and mm -hmm. so you never really got to mix with each other, you know. So that was your primary and only duty then, was the gun crew? Yeah. You didn't work with the, uh, the ship at all? No, no, we just, but anything. if they got stuck, we would help out. Mm -hmm. uh, like in the Philippines, we help on both cargo. Mm -hmm. We wanted to get out of there, and uh, emergencies would come up, they would, we would help to secure things and uh, well, anything would come up, but we worked with the crew pretty good, you know. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How was your quarters? Well, we had a, we had a, like, on the Liberty ship, we had, on the after part, there was three small rooms, and we, and half the crew was in there, and then up on the, main deck line, there was a, a room up there, and we had about 12 people in there. And that's where our mess hall was, uh, at the, at, at the uh, main part. And uh, we had good quarters. Uh, How was the food? The food, well, supposedly real good until you were out too long. Oh. And when you was out too long, you didn't eat so good. Like one time, all we had was spam for 30 days. Whoa. And in the morning, they would fry it. In the evening, or at one time, they'd cut it for lunch meat. And at night, they would roast it and put a pineapple slice on the top. And that was it. We had that for about 30 days. I wouldn't have, probably not right on 30 days, but we had it. And I still can't stand the smell of it. I, had, I tried to buy a, a can of it one day, and, and I opened it, and I got swimming. I had to throw it all the way. I just, uh, but spam. When the first few things it tasted pretty good, but we uh, uh, and, and of course you got uh, dehydrated potatoes, okay. powdered eggs, and the bread would get little weevils in it. And uh, at first you get real fussy, and you'd be picking them out. And then pretty soon you get to the point, oh heck! But uh, we used to say we never ate bread on Friday because because there was too much meat in it. Well, it's protein. I yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> That's what everybody said. Well, it's good for you. Yeah. <laughs> but overall, we ate pretty good. Uh -huh. Yeah. But every, when you're gone six, eight months, and you're running out of supplies, and you're going to different places, and, and they don't have it, so you're, you're, you run low, you know, and you eat powdered eggs, and you eat dehydrated potatoes, and canned meat. But what we used to do is borrow army rations. And we would fill and eat that. Now, they had little uh, cans of uh, hash and stew and beans, meat and beans. Now, the Army guys hated it because that's all they were was getting. But we, it was a treat for us because it was something different. So anybody in the country always had a case of something underneath your bunk. Uh -huh. And you'd throw it in a bucket, put a steam valve on it heat it up and you eat it, you know. That, that tasted better than spam after a while, you know. But it had its moments. Uh, uh -huh. Well, from now the, you went from the Philippines then to, what, what was your next well, tour? Well, we, uh, after we were hit, we went back to New Guinea to, for orders, and then we spent Christmas in New Guinea. You spent Christmas in four different countries? Yeah. What were the four again? Well, actually five. I spent 1942 in England, 43 in Sicily, 44 off in New Guinea, 45 in Japan. So that, that's the way I, they talk about Christmas and that's the way I, I remembered it. Okay. Then when we went back to New Guinea, we got orders to proceed to back to San Francisco. And in the meantime, at, in, at, at uh, Lady, we were hit with a kamikaze. And it put a big hole in the side of us. 
and we lost a lot of troops. There was, we, our casualty list was pretty high because they had been hitting ships and the captain decided to put the troops back in the holes where they could be seen and the airplane come through the side of us right into the hole and there was killed a lot of Air Force people in there, you know. So they, then they, they discharged the troops right away. We got, they got them off of it. Huh? What did they do to repair the ship then? Why you well, no, we, uh, we were going to go to Australia, but the degaussing system was knocked out. So they decided to send us back to the States. Because uh, uh, because the big gossip system would repel mines, oh. magnetic mines. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that we had to come back to the states. Uh, and then that's where you finished the war, then? No. I uh, went aboard the uh, Harriet Tubman, and we picked up a cargo of flour. We picked it up in Charleston, South Carolina, flour to bring for humanitarian reasons to, to Italy and Yugoslavia, but that's when President Roosevelt passed away. So on April the 13th, I think that's the day he was buried, we sailed for Virginia in a convoy, and we went back into the Mediterranean, and we went around to the east coast of Italy, to Ancona and Brandisi, and, and, uh, and we discharged this flower. But the Yugoslavians were gonna get some of it, but Marshal Tito wouldn't allow any American ships in their ports. So we were all set to go to Trieste because Trieste was supposed to be a really, a, it, was, it wasn't harmed. It was supposed to be a, it was an open city so they didn't bomb it. And we, and we didn't get to go up there. So they had to unload the flour on the trains, go up around the loop, back into Yugoslavia. It's because Tito wouldn't allow it. Well, uh, and that's when the Germans surrendered, and uh, what the business with Hitler and the, the bunkers and all that. So we took on a load of cargo, and we had some airplanes on the deck. We took, and we were bringing them to India. India, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we left the Mediterranean, went down there, and through Port Said down to the Red Sea, and through Suez, and around over to, uh, to India, to the Indian Ocean, but. The war in the Pacific was still going on. So we received orders and when we got back to Suez, the gun crew, except for one gunner's mate and one seaman, the rest of the crew would get off at Said and kept pick up a ship coming out of the United States with a shark gun crew and we would fill it up, you know, make the difference and we'd go on into the Pacific. But we got a break there as we're coming up back to the Red Sea, they dropped the bombs. So when we got into Port Said, they said, you return with your ship, we didn't get off. And then Ruth and I had planned, we were talking about getting married, so I wrote to her and I says, Ruth, go ahead and make arrangements. I said, I'll be getting a leave when we get into New York. And we didn't know what date it would be. But we got in around the first week of September, we got to New York. But but as we was leaving Port Said, I asked the gunnery officer, I said, what kind of watches should we stand? He said, I guess regular watches. I said, well, it's kind of silly to stand gun watch. The war is over. I said, the merchant crew is staying lookout watches. I said, did you ever hear a Mediterranean vacation? He said, yeah. I said, well, let's take one. I said, we'll keep the equipment out. And so for the couple of weeks it took us from get to uh, Egypt to New York, we, we didn't stand watches. We just Kept our, uh, we maintained everything and kept our quarters clean. And so, so when we pulled into New York, I was all set to come home to get married, and I had no leaves. They said all these were canceled, be uh, canceled because of the war in it. And I said, oh my God, I was telling the leave officer, he said, well, if you could come up with something, he said, we'll see. And one of the guys said, why don't you get transferred? So I went back up, I said, can you transfer me to the West Coast? So he said, yeah, we can do that. And so that's how I, I got assigned to minesweepers. So we, uh, I went home, we got married, I went back to Chicago. I, got, I think I was given 10 days leave or something like that in travel time. And I got back to Chicago and we went on to San Francisco to a Navy base out there. 
We won aboard transports, and I was assigned to the USS Red Star. It was a minesweeper, an AM. Uh, and we went to uh, Okinawa, but uh, the sweepers had already moved up to Japan. So we went up to Sasebo, and I got off the, this uh, transport at Sasebo, and I was assigned to the Red Star. And uh, I, we had heard that we were on a, we did several minesweeper jobs in the six months I was on there. But on December the 29th, we were sweeping mines off of Tushima, in Tushima Straits, that's between Korea and Japan. Now, we were with a sweeper called the Minivet and another sweeper, that I don't remember the name. And we were working with the Japanese. The Japanese were sweeping the mines. The Minivet was laying buoys, and that would be like a football field. You, you'd start sweeping on one end, you come across, they put a buoy there, and then they put a buoy on the other end, and you move over, and they put buoys and mark it off. Mm -hmm. Well, and we were gonna, we were gonna destroy the mines. And, I, and we, there was a mine popped up, and I was shooting at it, and it then exploded, it sunk. Because it would crack, and you didn't hit the harms, you know. Well, the Minivet's coming along, and we had stopped shooting at another mine, and it hit a mine. Oh. And it blew it completely out of the water. And then you could look underneath the, it was 280 foot long, you could look underneath the whole thing was out of the water. And I forget how many people they lost, but it was it sunk in a couple, a few minutes. Mm -hmm. But they said that was the last official act of World War II. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if how it reads that, but that's what we were told. You know, I, I read that in a, our magazine a few, all about a year ago. But that was the last official act of World War. So you were a witness to the last Yeah, uh, which I, we didn't know at the time, you know. And then uh, we got back into Sasebo, and I we spent Christmas there. Sasebo. So that was my uh, 1945 Christmas. So they decided to send all the Reserve Navy back to the United States, and they just kept, I was in the regular Navy, they just kept the regular Navy there. So we went, that's when I went aboard the USS Champion, 314, because all the regular Navy is on it. And the first of all, we're all set up, the next morning we went to quarters for muster, and the captain said, we're all regular Navy, no more belly aching. And, you know, so uh, I was aboard there until all the following November, but then they come out with a program, if you were on your first enlistment, you could get off, if, him to get off a year early. So I, um, I decided to do that. But that time I was a gunner's mate second class. Uh, she said, if you stay on, make your gunner's mate first class. Well, I wasn't going to stay in the Navy. I made it my mind. So I thought, well, I, I you know, uh, do that. So I chose to get off. And I uh, got off in uh, November of 40. Six, yeah, 46. And I come home and I was on the uh, terminal leave. Then uh, I was, my discharge was this, uh, January the 12th, 1947. Five years to the day that I was, I was, in, I was in the Navy. Wow. So that, that was it. Sounds I hope I didn't forget something. Oh, sure. I hope I told you everything. Huh? Here's but a, there's the show. a picture here that I thought was really neat. This is the gun. Uh, and it's got a pinup on one of the ships. What ship was this on? That was on a Mars and Wake. Mars and Wake was a, a merchant ship. Yeah, and that was the, we named her Vigilant Virgin. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a uh, pinup, I usually see them on B-17 yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, then that. on the uh, Red Star, show that one, that's the girl on the back. Yeah, it there. It's a big, it's a photo, it's a piece of paper. Oh, no, I think oh. that's still there. Oh, okay. But it, yeah. Here's a picture of Ed back in his spam days when he loved spam. Uh -huh. That's why he's so lean and mean. <laughs> spam man. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had that picture made when I turned 80. I, they threw a birthday party on me. And my one grandson, he had it blowed up real big. And then I, it is, I guess it's three by four foot. And I have that at home. Uh -huh. But that was the end of the Navy. Nice. <laughs> but I got to, 
I got to see the world. Are you sure? They yeah, told me that yeah. I'd see the world. I got to see the yeah, world. Two or three or four times over. Yeah. <laughs> I never did figure out how many miles I went. Fourteen times. Fourteen. And I crossed the Pacific four times. And then when I went in the Gulf, that was a half because we didn't. It was a hit, you know. Uh, 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 were you ever seasick? Oh God, yeah. Uh -huh. On the minesweepers, there was only uh, about 200 feet long, 220s, I think. Uh, and one, and the captain used to get a little sick. And one time I'm going up, leaving the watch on the bridge, and he says, uh, and he was bugging me because he knew I'd get sick. And I had tossed my cookies, as they say, on the way up there. And he, I guess he knew it. And he said, uh, "How was Chow?" And I said, it was better going out than it was going in. <laughs> well, he had to run for the rail, and he, he got sick to his stomach. He come back in, he said, you ever do that again? He said, you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been on a small ship, and I guess he's like, I'm just trying to think how many times I would have gotten seasick yeah. during this fight. Well, I used to get uh, feeling bad, but the first couple of days, you get sort of get used to it. But then, honest to gosh, in the, in the early, you, could, you were so darn scared in the North Atlantic. Yeah. You didn't have time to get sick. Right. And you never took your life jacket off. You wore that. And you didn't take a shower from New York to England. Any darn fool that took all his clothes off had to, be, had to have their head examined. Because just like that, it could happen. You sure. know? So you were, uh, oh, about 16 days between showers. And you'd throw a little bit of water on your face and wash your hands, but, uh, but you never, your life jacket was always right there. Uh, uh, you know when you slept too? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You slept with your clothes on, and uh, you, you have your life jacket, you use your life jacket for a pillow, you know. Okay, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you do where it was. Oh time. yeah, <laughs> and it was under the law, never touch somebody's life jacket. Really? Oh, you never. Never touch anybody's life jacket. Sure. Because everybody had their own little thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing you did not do is touch somebody's life jacket. Uh -huh. When you went, you were sunk one time. Did you come close to being uh, sunk uh, again during the five years? Or? Well, and when we were running to England, like that ship right next to us was torpedo, and it hit us in its on its stern. And I guess if it had been another thirty or forty feet back of it, we would have got it midships. Uh -huh. Now, I, I think they were probably shooting for us. And then this other ship dropped back in the meantime and got hit. Otherwise, uh, then, then with the bombing, we, when we were bombed in Missouri, we had uh, water splash up on the decks where the plane would come down and drop one wing bombs on, and it was right off our stern and drop the other wing bombs off and be right off our bow, you know. What was this thing? In Brazerti, Brazerti. In North Africa. Okay. Uh, and, uh, I think there was 12 ships sunk that night, and they lost. The Germans lost seven planes. Uh -huh. uh -huh. That must have been scary too. Yeah, you well, had to worry about the above that, and below. Yeah, that was my first air raid I was in, and we were anchored in Missouri. And Bob Hope was doing his tour. He was in Missouri that night, and in that book he wrote, he mentions it in there that we're in Missouri. You know, and then he had an air raid. You know. Did you see Bob Hope? No, no, no. Did you no. see one machine? No, we never got to see stuff like that because we were, you couldn't get off, you couldn't get off the ship or uh, you were doing something else, you know, it was, we, we lived a little different world. Uh, okay. Uh, you mean when you hit port, you couldn't get off? Oh, yeah, but there wasn't, uh, uh, you had, like, in, when there was civilization, you had to be back by five or six o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, now, England, you could, you'd be, you could go off the ship and be back at 11, I think. 11, I think, was when you had to be back. But like in Italy and the Africa and stuff, he had me back by son. Mm -hmm. by son. So you did get to see part of the world. Of the oh sun. yeah, but then like uh, the first time I went into the Mediterranean, we tried to drink it dry, and that was silly. Right. So the next time I went in there, I started seeing the ruins, the churches, and all the things. Seeing like we went to Pompeii, visited Pompeii, mm -hmm. and uh, and some of the old ruins, uh, churches and cathedrals, and we. I started seeing stuff, and I thought, this is stupid, then. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, you didn't use money, you used cigarettes. Cigarettes oh. was the big bartering thing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
And uh, one time, I'm selling a carton of cigarettes to a guy, and I'm lowering the cigarettes down to him, and he's down there folding the money over in the middle, short cutting me, and I, in the meantime, had opened up the carton of cigarettes, and they had two packs on one end, and put paper in the middle and two packs on the other end, because if you didn't cheat him, he would get you. So, so it was a game, and everybody knew it, they knew it, and you knew it. And, uh -huh. and the new people would be uh, get taken. They went, uh, and like and when he's in North Africa, the uh, Arabs, uh, they wore long things, uh, dress type thing, so we sold our bed sheets. And then they would cut a hole for their head and for their arms, they'd put the bed, you know, they were bunk size, and they would wear them for clothes, uh huh. Right. So we, and we sold them for, I guess you'd get a couple cartons of cigarettes. And, they would uh, give me, or you would trade for something, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if you see something, you'd trade for it. But the first time in there, I, I used money, but the second time, and from then on, no, never no money. It was okay. all cigarettes. Okay. Uh, Did you run across any notables? Uh, like, uh, like, you didn't see Pat by chance? Or? Uh, I see MacArthur in Japan. Did you? Uh, we were in uh, Tokyo, and uh, all of a sudden, three cars pulled up, and some MPs jumped out, and then the middle car, he and he walks up to the building, and it was MacArthur. He's the only one I ever seen was MacArthur. Okay. Well, of course you were always in them. Yeah, but I did. I seen Gene Tunney. He was a boxer. Right. I seen him down in uh, Puerto Rico, and he waved. He was a, a commander, a lieutenant commander, or something like that. And he, he waved behind. Okay. But he, yeah. But MacArthur, I, that's I never seen anybody else. Uh, uh, did any of your compatriots or? Anybody that you serve with, did any of them go on to become famous uh, career? Ones? No, 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 no. Did they were like you, they just went they were, Everybody, <laughs> had, when their time was up, they got out. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, because they, they had it, you know. And you went in, and when you went in, maybe you wasn't going on a thing of staying all your life, although you thought you might. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was, you, you, things were changed, you know. And, and the Navy changed. I didn't like the peacetime Navy. Oh. Because it got strict, you know, and, and the, everything was this and that. And we're in the wartime, maybe there was, it, you had a little bit of leniencies, but in the peacetime, maybe it was all together different. I didn't the book. And it was all playing games from that on. You'd have a, a go to quarters, you knew nothing was going to happen, you know. But during the war, when you went to quarters, you mm -hmm. it could happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So the. Well, they brought women in too, or didn't they kind of show that they Well, no, so you know, they were, uh, uh, the first time I ever seen a wave, uh, no, a wave, I guess they called it, yeah, a wave, was up in Brooklyn, and this girl had a blouse on with little things there, little torpedoes, or little propellers, and I thought, oh, that'd be a nice blouse, I'd get Ruthie, you know. And she said, you have to join the waves. The waves, and I said, what's the waves? And she told me, you know. So I said, well, Ruthie went one in. She won't, she won't get one of them blouses then. Uh, no. What did she do going for? She worked at, at her at the Dixie Terminal Food Shop. Oh. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. She worked She worked there. Huh? Yeah, I remember that. I used yeah. to live in Gummington. Yeah. 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 Well, oh, yeah. Her. Everybody knew yeah. the food shop. Her name was Ruth. You might even, uh, of course, you were too young. Huh? Yeah. I'm only 73. So yeah. So you're, you're just a couple years old. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm 85 now. Okay. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. And your, your service as well as being the survivor of 85. But uh, I, I did get to see the world. You sure did? Yeah. You yeah, didn't regret that either? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no. Would you do it again? Oh, heck, yeah, I would if you're younger, you know. Yeah, that yeah. age. Yeah. But I think, uh, see, I was 20 years old when the war started. Oh. And I went down on the, I worked in a machine shop. I worked down on the 8th of December to join the army, and they wouldn't take me because I had a hernia. So then I bumped into a guy, and he said, well, then on Christmas, I bumped into a pharmacist, maybe he saw the Navy will take you and operate on you. So, I, and that's why I said I was in the hospital at Great Lakes, I went in there for that operation. So and I spent, out. And I spent two months there, and I used to think, boy, oh, you knucklehead, you could have been home yeah. instead of over here, you know. Uh, uh, but no, I wouldn't have missed it. So, uh, yeah. 
And uh, it was a different world. It was different thoughts. And yeah. You had different reasons. And, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, the whole thing. When the bomb was dropped, you said you were over in the Indian Ocean? Of the Red Sea. Uh -huh. Red Sea. Yeah. Okay. Was it quite jubilant at the time? Well, we were by ourselves. And we're going through there, and they, we heard it on the news, and we said, oh my God, that has to be some damn bomb, you know. Because was, uh, some of them were time more powerful than a record bomb, you know. And, uh, and I guess, as far as jumping up and down and stuff, I guess it was happy, but I didn't make a big thing out of it, you know. Because, oh, we was more concerned, well, was we still going to get off the ship or not? And they told us we could stay on, and we were more happy about that. Then the other one, you know, but you knew the war was gonna was would be done, done then, you know. Mm -hmm. But then I went, I spent a year in Japan, and uh, those people were scared of us at first, because I got there in November of '45, and and they, the people were because they were all hopped up to what the Americans were gonna do to them, and no, uh, they they were they and then, we, then we worked with a, well, I guess we worked with a, several uh, mines, uh, Japanese sweepers, we worked with them for months and we got to know them pretty good and, and you kept cigarettes they didn't have cigarettes so you uh, like uh, uh, when the minivet was hit and sunk and the Japanese picked up a lot of survivors and they brought them over to us and I think everybody on the ship gave them a cart of cigarettes that was that was more uh, gratitude than thank but they, you know because cigarettes was a big thing you know um, you said that you worked with the minesweepers from Japan uh -huh. Uh, how did you work? What, what did you? Well, they they did the sweeping, and we would do the. Uh, this was the actual war. Yeah. Uh, oh, you were still clearing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So that, that operation at Tushima was, uh, I guess, the last big. Okay. And then after we got hit, I understand they sent other sweepers up there and, and finished the job. You know. Okay. I mean, we didn't get hit, but the minute event was hit. You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. So they still we didn't. Put them out. We just kept them in. Their yeah, service. yeah. We worked with them. Uh, okay. Yeah. And at, uh, at Tushima, the mines were seven and a half foot under the water. And the American sweepers, we threw, I think, nine foot forward and eleven foot aft. So it was disaster waiting to happen. You know. Right. But of course, you, there's always uh, risk factors. You know. But if, if, it, if all the mines were picked up and popped and they were floating, there wouldn't be no trouble because you'd be sinking them. But I guess there were stragglers under there, it was missed, you know, and that's what the Minabet hit, you know. How long ago would you do? Uh, well, when you, no, that was their records. In a minesweeper, you send out a buoy, it trails behind you, it was, and then it goes down with a, a, sl a sled like thing. It, and uh, you go by your speed, that pulls the sled down to the depth you want. And then there's a certain kind of wire on there, a cutting effect. And that runs on the runs the cable where the mine is, that rubs against there and cuts it loose and then it pop up to the top. But wouldn't you have went over the mine in order to Yeah, uh huh. Why didn't the mine get you? Well, see, we were lucky we were that we were uh, just missed it, you know. They had made the pass and there wasn't any mines there and, and we're laying off of it. But we were close. Well, we were close, I guess, 100 feet away from it, you know. Okay. Uh, it was risky business. You had to uh, secure all water, water departments. Everything had to be secured. Everything had to be watertight in case you got hit, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it, and everybody had to wear a life jacket. Sure. Uh -huh. So you, you took precautions. But there was part of the risk, you know, uh -huh. that you were on there, and that's what you did. Just like an aircraft carrier. Whatever they did, they had to risk, you know, like uh, like people getting hit with propellers and things like that. There was always some risk somewhere along the line, you know. Did you spend much time on shore in Japan then during that 12 months that you were over there? Yeah, uh, we, uh, when we wasn't sweeping, you'd get every other day off or every third day or something like that. Did the people have any resentment toward you other than maybe fear? Just a few. I, it was, some young people, but no, most of the people were nice. We had, I, the Japanese were easy to get along with, you know. Mm -hmm. Then the sailors we worked with, oh, they, we got to be real friendly with them. Uh, of course, there was always that thing behind you, what they had done. So there was always some feelings behind you that you, uh, 
you never really let go of, you know, and I guess you still have it today, you know, that you, that, uh, you, you things you just don't, you keep in memory, you know, like the kamikaze piles coming down here and stuff like that, you don't forget that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, like this guy hit us, he was dead when he hit us because he was all slumped over. Mm -hmm. He was, he, and uh, the, apparently the, the plane got kind of current and flipped over, maybe he leaned or, you know, and that shit went, that's when I went through the side of us. Otherwise, it would have just missed us, you know. What do you think you hit it with? Uh, a 20 uh, millimeter. Uh, okay. Uh, and you had a 5 inch, do you say? We had, no, we had a 4 inch 50 on there, and they shot down a plane. Okay. Uh, and then that's when we were debating to change the name of Vigilant Virgin. To Deadline? <laughs> to, to some, you know, some other name, some, some name, but we thought, oh, that sounds, that rhymes pretty good, so we uh -huh. just left it on. But uh, this tent gun, it ex its shell exploded right alongside of a Japanese plane. And it blew that plane into an LST, and they lost people. Uh, and the reason I knew that, I talked to a commander from the uh, Naval Museum, and I had an article in our magazine, and he, and he uh, wrote to me, and he said he was on that LST that was, and they lost some people when that plane come to hit them, you know. But you, you talk and you remember more stories, you know. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. sure. That's what's so nice about this project, yeah. so that you can pass yeah. those things on. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you threw me off there. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the, uh, the, the kamikaze. Um, did you see many other kamikaze? Did they come in oh, yeah. large amounts? Yeah, they would come in groups. Uh -huh. And we did, did it for six weeks. We see them. Or it wasn't them would be a, a high altitude bombers, or they would be strafing you. Or, uh, okay. the, 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 like the day we went into the Philippines, the lady, there was an air raid going on, and the day we left, there was an air raid going on. So you left. Uh, you know. mm -hmm. So we were we spent at, well, at quarters. I guess we spent more time at quarters than we did not. You know. Mm -hmm.